I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackleford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. If you haven't been to the fabulous World of Marty Stewart exhibit upstairs yet, you'll have an excellent opportunity to do so and do so for free tomorrow, Thursday, August 4th at 11 a.m. when Dan Bernard will give a gallery talk. Bernard is executive director of Marty Stewart's Congress of Country Music, which will open soon in Philadelphia, Mississippi. So we're looking forward to that. And then plan to join us this Sunday, August the 7th, for our summer music series featuring Connor Ball, who will be performing here from noon to 4 p.m. Remember that admission to the museums is free on Sundays and includes admission to our two special exhibits. And then I hope you'll come back next week for History's Lunch when we'll have Kevin Green and Andrew Wiest from the University of Southern Mississippi to present the National Guard and the War on Terror. Today, we are delighted to have the award-winning author, photographer, and cultural documentarian, Candace Taylor, author of the book Overground Railroad, The Green Book, and the Roots of Black Travel in America. We're holding this program in conjunction with the fantastic Green Book exhibit, which is upstairs here, and we're partnering with our friends, the Mississippi Humanities Council. Here to say a few words about the Green Book exhibit, Great Migration, and our speakers is Stuart Rockoff, director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. Thank you, Chris. Um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Mississippi Humanities Council. And over the past half century, one of our closest and best partners, of course, has been the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. So we are especially pleased to be a co-sponsor of today's program with Ken Dacey Taylor um, through a special Reflecting Mississippi grant. Our 50th, um, our 50th anniversary theme is Reflecting Mississippi, which seeks to explore how our history, how our narratives have or have not accurately reflected who we are and where we've been. And I think Ms. Taylor's research and writing on black travel and the Green Book brings to light an important but sometimes unheralded part of both American and indeed Mississippi history. So we're very excited to be involved in this. The Mississippi Humanities Council is an independent nonprofit organization supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and also by grants and donations from foundations, corporations, and individuals. We support a wide range of public humanities programs across Mississippi. We create opportunities for Mississippians to learn about themselves and the larger world and enrich communities through civil conversations about our history and culture. And certainly History is Lunch is a wonderful example of just that. Um, you can learn more about us on our website, mshumanities.org, or on the various social media channels. Now, I have the great honor of introducing our panelists today, uh, one of whom should, should not need much of an introduction to this crowd, but it is my great honor to do it. In 2017, Pamela D.C. Jr. became the first director of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and in 2019 was named director of the two Mississippi museums. Pam Jr. has had more than 20 years of experience in public history, with 17 years at the Smith Robertson Museum and Cultural Center here in Jackson, where she served as museum manager, where I first met her. A graduate of Jackson State University, Junior is the recipient of a For My People Award from the Margaret Walker Center, has been named a hometown hero by Visit Jackson, and was honored with the 2019 Association of African American Museums Leadership Award for her work. And our, our special guest today, of course, is Candace Taylor, who is an award-winning author, photographer, and cultural documentarian. She is the author of a book, which is for sale over there, of the Overground Railroad, the Green Book and the Roots of Black Travel in America. And she was the curator and content specialist for the exhibit upstairs. And if you haven't yet gotten a chance to go through it, do not miss it. It is spectacular. And from here, it is continuing on a national tour sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution's Traveling, Exhi um, Traveling Exhibition Service. 
Um, Taylor's work has been featured in The Atlantic, CBS Sunday Morning, The Guardian UK, The Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, PBS NewsHour, and The Wall Street Journal. That pretty much covers all the bases there, folks. So please welcome our, um, um, our panel, Pam Jr. and Ken Dacey Taylor. You know, I'm excited for a couple of reasons, and that is to have Ken Dacey Taylor on the stage here. And then the exhibition that we have upstairs is just amazing. So thank you for everything that you do oh, to, to teach us. You know, I, I, as, as we talked, I talked about telling Ken Dacey that we have to always honor our ancestors. And in this amazing book, Overground Railroad, you talk about Ron, your stepfather, Talk to us about how he led you to, or helped you to want to write this book. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, love Mississippi, and any chance I get to come, I, I say yes. Um, and thank you again for everybody coming today. Um, Overground Railroad was such a labor of love, and I started this project in 2013. Um, and I really didn't, a lot of people didn't know about the Green Book at that time. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw my first green book tucked under glass at the Autry Museum. I was living in Los Angeles at that time, and I rushed outside because I was so shocked and overwhelmed mm. that this thing had existed and that I hadn't known about it. Mm. And so I called my parents, and I asked my mother. She had never heard of it, but my stepfather, Ron, had. And he, and he was from Memphis, Tennessee, dark-skinned black man. He was like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember that. And I'd known this man since I was 12. Um, he was the only father I really knew, and we were very, you know, he, he was from the South, so he loved to tell stories. He would just talk all the time, <laughs> to the point where we had heard these stories before. <laughs> we just thought, okay. You know, we'd try and scoot out of the kitchen when he went on another one of his long <laughs> Southern yarns. And, um, but he had never told me these stories. Uh, since I started doing this research. And all of a sudden, um, the more different, the different layers about what it meant to be a dark-skinned black man growing up in the Jim Crow South, all of the, um, there's a chauffeur's hat, you know, mm -hmm. story that I opened the book with. Um, this was one of those things where I would call Ron and say, I'm finding this in the archives. There are people talking about having a chauffeur's hat in their car as a ruse or some kind of prop. Mm -hmm especially if they had a nicer car um, for a black family because it would not instigate or you know, create any um, problems with law enforcement because as soon as they got pulled over, if they had a nicer car, law enforcement would assume they had stolen the car. And so I asked Ron one day, I said, you know, is this true? You know, I'm reading it in the archives, but you never know, right, until you have more of a personal Experience and he just unloaded this story to me, um, and I had never known this. You know that he had experienced it as a seven-year-old. Um, mm -hmm. His father was; they were driving north, going to they passed the Tennessee border, and they got pulled over by a sheriff. And he, his mother was with him, and they were, you know, on vacation. And the sheriff, you know, was walking towards the door, and. Uh, his father said, you know, don't say a word. Mm -hmm. And looked at Ron in this way, he had never seen his father talk to him in this tone. Um, you know, he knew something was, was about to happen. He didn't know what. The sheriff says, you know, whose car is this? Mm -hmm. Where are you going? Who are these people with you? And Ron's father said, you know, it's my employer's car. Um, he looked at his wife and he pretended he didn't know her and said, that's the maid. And, her son is in the back and I'm driving them home. And Ron, you know, didn't, he just sat there tight-lipped and uh, the sheriff said, well, where's your hat? And he said, oh, it's hanging right in the back, officer. <laughs> and Ron looked and he had always seen this black chauffeur's hat hanging in the back seat and never knew what it was. Nobody ever wore it. <laughs> he mm -hmm. never understood why it was always there. And after that day, he said he saw it in nearly every black man's car. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was those stories that, you know, humanized this history for me in a way that made it more accessible for me to write about mm -hmm. this material. And feeling, you know, I was in my 40s when I started this project, and I just, 
even though I'd taken a lot of black studies courses and had gone to Harvard for this, you know, scholarly research, there was nothing that would match the, um, the stories and the experiences that I had with Ron in the book. And so he becomes a narrative thread. A lot of people may not know about the Green Book. Talk to us a little bit about Victor Hugo Green and, and why he even decided to say, okay, we need this. Yeah. Now, the Green Book was a travel guide that was published for black people from 1936 to 1967. So it was critical. I mean, most people assume that it was the only one. So just so you know, there were nearly a dozen other black travel guides. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the only one. Um, and it wasn't the first one. The first one was Hackley and Harrison's in 1930. So the Green Book comes in 1936. Victor Green is living in Harlem with his wife Alma. They're living in the Sugar Hill District, um, which is, you know, the sweet life. It was a beautiful area. Um, Langston Hughes, Duke Ellington were their mm -hmm. um, neighbors. And uh, they were just a very distinguished couple. And they created the Green Book um, to solve their own problem because half of the shops on 125th Street in Harlem, either you had different rules for black folks. You couldn't sit in the orchestra seats, or you had to, you know, there were certain stores that wouldn't serve you. And so they, it was a, it was a Harlem-based guide, and then it grew so quickly because there was such a need. Within three years, it was in every state east of the Mississippi River. So it grew very fast, and um, it was, a lifesaver because it showed, it was almost like a yellow pages of black entrepreneurs and businesses. It had, was not a traditional travel guide. Um, there was everything from not just food and lodging, but there were drug stores to get prescriptions. There were nightclubs, hair salons, mm -hmm. haberdashers, funeral homes. I mean, it was just, you know, incredible. Um, and just a great, you know, testament of what we as black folks were able to accomplish and have these businesses, you know, despite the circumstances. So the Green Book would take you to the black neighborhood where all, you could just relax and you knew that, you know, anything you needed was mm -hmm. there. Yeah, before we get into your travels, because you did a lot of traveling throughout the United States, looking at these different sites. Mm -hmm. When you and I talked, you compared Mr. Green to Steve Jobs. Oh, right. Yeah, I, I think he was the Steve Jobs of his time. And I say that because I'm sure when Steve Jobs put a camera and a phone, he, did not, he didn't think he was going to create a tool that would launch a, another civil rights era, right? Um, he was, again, solving a problem um, that, and he had a very, uh, he was a genius for other reasons, but this was a very simple solution to a, to a problem. So I think in, in the same way, Victor Green, when he created the Green Book, he was, again, solving his own problem in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And yet there was such a need for it, and it was so incredibly pervasive in the sense that just people just used it because it was so, it saved people's lives, it made them comfortable, um, and it triggered an exodus of whether it was the black migration that was happening during those decades when the Green Book was at its heyday, or it just helped black folks, uh, middle class black folks, get into different spaces throughout the country that they never had access mm -hmm. to. You know, I mean, there were golf courses and beaches in the Green Book, and there were a lot of white spaces that black folks all of a sudden had access to. So I think, you know, that helped America as a whole, not mm -hmm. just black folks, but seeing black middle class people um, in these spaces where no, white people had never seen them before. Mm -hmm. And in some cases it was not a good thing, but in a lot of cases it was just the right thing. And that, you know, it triggered this whole, um, I think it changed the, the culture and the tone of the country and pushed it towards, you know, our civil rights legislation in mm -hmm. 1964. Mm -hmm. When you traveled, because you went a lot of places, yeah. all over the United States, let's go into that, and, and you're by yourself. Yeah, I, I'm a loner. I travel alone. <laughs> Talk about that yeah. a little bit. I, 
you know, I've been doing this work for about 20, over 20 years, about 23 years. And I did travel with my mother in my early, my first two books. Um, she was my travel buddy. Um, but she passed and uh, miss her so terribly. Mm -hmm. but, um, but for this project, you know, it was Ron that was kind of on the phone with me in the car, talking my ear off again. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I've traveled over 100,000 miles now just documenting sites uh, that were listed in the Green Book. Um, I'm also scouting sundown towns, which yeah. were, for those of you who don't know, they were all white communities that banned black people after dark. Um, so I am, for me, and when I'm on the road, I'm working 16-hour days, and it's just a I wouldn't put anybody through that, honestly. It was part of the reason why I just travel mm -hmm. by myself. But, um, but I, you know, my road, the road is like a meditative experience for me. It's really almost like a spiritual practice for me in a, in a strange way. And most years, um, I'm on the road, you know, at least half the months of the year um, documenting, you know, this history and getting a pulse of the country because I think you can't really, for me, I can't understand this history until I understand what these neighborhoods where these Green Book sites were. What do they look like today and why? You know, what were the government forces and the things that were shaping the way these communities operate? Because they didn't look like that mm -hmm. then. Baltimore and Detroit and Cleveland and a lot of these migration uh, cities where people migrated from the you know, they became very concentrated um, uh, with black folks, but then after the civil rights legislation passed and integration did happen, a lot of um, black people with means left these communities and created this kind of hyper-segregated um, and, and poverty-stricken neighborhoods. And then the local, state, and city governments disinvested in these communities and educational, I mean, we know the stories, right? But I think it's important to, to get a sense of, you know, when I drive through, I'm in Chicago and 53 people are shot in the weekend I was there, in the neighborhood I was scouting. And it, it just, and I'm sitting in my car with my camera equipment and thinking, and I'm in the black neighborhood, and this is supposed to be a safe zone. And I'm nervous to get out of my car to even just go to use a bathroom in a gas station. And I thought, you know, Victor Green and mm -hmm. Dr. King would be turning in their graves because mm -hmm. that is not what these places were like. And so to get a truer understanding about the impact of, you know, our responsibility as citizens and our government to, um, if they can create those problems, they can dismantle them, yeah. you know, but I think we have a... Um, we, you know, we have to get a different, um, uh, there, there needs, and I can't say that it's up to us as individuals because in a lot of times we do feel powerless, but I think we've accepted the unacceptable for too long. So again, it, it's important for me to see these spaces and understand them, you know, in terms of the field research is just as important as a scholarly. You know, help, help us imagine, because a lot of folks in the audience may not be able to visually see how life was mm -hmm. when Victor Green had this, this green book and the tourist houses and the hotels, and then when you go to these same places today, how different they look. Yeah, well, thankfully for the exhibition, right? Yeah. We get yeah. to see that. We get to see this, um, you know, black America where there were independently owned businesses and there were, you know, women dressed in, you know, to the nines and um, men with their, you know, hats on. And, and I don't want to romanticize that time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do want people to understand that um, there was a vibrancy and these communities were self-sufficient and they were, um, they had their own problems like any other, you know, place at, at any other time in the country, but today is a special situation. This is not normal, it's not um, humane. Um, you know, there, I think there are differences in terms of how we need to, um, 
to address it and to think about it. But at that time, you know, there were definitely people that had, there were tourist homes that, uh, there were oh God, over 1,400 of them in the Green Book, and tourist mm -hmm. homes were, um, you know, mostly run by widowed black women. Um, they were kind of the Airbnbs of their day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we kind of did that too. Um, they, and they, it was usually women who had an extra room and, a, you know, would cook a warm meal. And they were affordable um, options, especially for migrant families who were fleeing racial terror in the South and moving north for, you know, thinking they'd find a better life. Um, so they, you know, they were affordable options uh, for people who couldn't maybe afford a, a hotel. And then there were, like I said, black middle class and wealthy people who would stay in, you know, there was the A.G. Gaston or there mm -hmm. were these other nicer Places. There were a lot of white-owned businesses in the Green Book. The Waldorf Astoria was in the Green Book. Yeah. Um, you know, in the 60s, you see these more iconic, the Drake Hotel in New York, the Bel Air in L.A. So this idea that, you know, the Green Book only had these, you know, if you saw the film, you mm -hmm. may think, because they got it wrong, right. Right. that <laughs> the only place Dr. Shirley could stay was this downtrodden place where he was very uncomfortable. It wasn't his, you know... But if he had been in, as the film takes him to Birmingham at that mm -hmm. time in the 60s, he would have stayed at the A.G. Gaston where Dr. Mm -hmm. King stayed. Mm -hmm. So there were options for all kinds of, you know, folks at different stages or financial, um, you know, different classes of black folks. So I think that's the point. And that's what, you know, even the exhibition shows is that there's a variety, just like any other race, there's a variety of classes. And because of hypersegregation during the Jim Crow era, they were all in the same neighborhood and because of redlining and you know, all of these other, that was a you know, government decision, um, that yeah, you find there are these um, enclaves and then it just all got, it all changed in the 60s. Sundown towns, and, and you mentioned that a little bit and I know that when people went through those areas, they, they couldn't stay. There were signs there. Mm -hmm. Well, some downtowns are fascinating only because we didn't even really know about them or know as much about them today until James Lowen wrote his book, mm -hmm. Sundown Towns. And that was in the early, I think, 2005 when he started that research. I believe the book came out in 2009. But, um, and he's passed yeah. now. Um, so, but he was the premier, and he was a white man mm -hmm. who was able to go to these towns, you know, that would, that had this troublesome history, and he'd be hanging out there for a few days before they would actually admit, you know, first they'd say, oh, we don't know what you're talking about, and then they say, oh, yeah, but there was a bell, there was a siren that rang every night yeah. at six o'clock that would yeah. tell black people they had to leave because people who were working in the community, the mm -hmm. domestics, and, mm -hmm. um, laborers uh, would have to leave. That was their signal. Um, there were signs at the county line saying, inward, don't let the sun set on you here. Mm -hmm. And this was largely in the north. These were not, you know, most people assume the south is, gets a bad rap in terms of, you know, it's always demonized because you had the Jim Crow signs, but at least you were honest about where you were, and there weren't these kind of covert... <laughs> you know, systems in place like redlining and things that were very urban renewal, things that really did decimate uh, black communities and actually hurt black people. So if you were, but the thing is, the sundown towns, there was no map of sundown towns mm -hmm. during the Jim Crow era. So you didn't know if, that's how I stumbled onto this research. I was commissioned to write a book on Route 66 and I learned very early in my research that half the counties on Route 66 were sundown towns. Wow. So out of 89 counties, about 44 of them. And Route 66 is going west, right? It They're runs from California, Chicago, Chicago to Los Angeles. It's yeah. three quarters of the continent of North America. Wow. And, and I thought, well, okay, because of the nostalgia around Route 66 is you jump in your Airstream trailer and you're having a good time and you're getting your kicks on Route 66 and, <laughs> you know, Nat King Cole sang the iconic song and yet he couldn't even eat in half the places on Route 66 or, you know, it was just this. And I thought, 
how in the world did black people travel Route 66? And because mm -hmm. I had, was the only black woman to ever write a major travel guide on Route 66, mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess m the other white male writers hadn't asked that question or stumbled onto this history. So that was how I found the Green Book. I was in the Autry researching this Route 66 exhibition, and then all of a sudden I see a Green Book. And I thought, oh, well, maybe that's how they did it. You know, but again, they didn't have a map of sundown towns, so mm -hmm. you still wouldn't know. If you're driving, you could easily end up in the wrong place mm -hmm. at the wrong time, and it was like a minefield. And I think that reality, it just gave me more um, respect. And I was so inspired by the, you know, so when you see these women, you know, that Cars Beach image of the women and their, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just, it's inspiring that they just did it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they were in facing all of this potential, not just adversity, you know, there were serious consequences. Um, and, and they still live their lives and did it anyway. So hopefully when you see those images, you remember that, um, what they were facing. Yeah. Chapter four and chapter five of the book, chapter four is license to leave. Mm -hmm. People leaving and, and going to other places because they don't like being in the South anymore. Mm -hmm. I have to move. Mm -hmm. Kind of delve into that a little bit. Well, I think, again, the Green Book gave them that license, right? It, it was a way, making a way out of no way. Mm -hmm. um, but also that, you know, that chapter was really about understanding that the idea that there was this other experience or other life you can have if you just left the South. Mm -hmm. And that they learned very quickly that Jim Crow had no borders. But even though, you know, and there was a Chicago Defender, and there were mm -hmm. all of these you know, newspapers that were really trying to say there's opportunities in the North, and in some cases there were, but the living conditions and the reality of white flight, I mean, suburbia kind of was started at that time because black people were finding themselves in these cities, and then all of a sudden the government, you know, the city and state government said, oh, we have to redline these communities, you can't have mortgages here, you can't, you know, there were all of these systems in place to keep black people in one part of that city and then white folks would leave and, and then there was a lot of um, racism and drama and you know, chapter four and five shows the just written testimonies of black people who had left the South saying, I don't know, what the, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I know that I can't cross this street in Chicago or otherwise people ask me for my papers. Um, it was, you know, like a police state, mm -hmm. or there was, you know, you just pay off certain cops if they saw you in certain areas. Um, but there were all these unwritten rules about how to be in the North. And I think that, you know, again, we just, as a country, and what you learn in the history books is that, you know, people just found opportunity and they decided to leave <laughs> the South. And then it was, they had these great jobs and these great lives in the North. Mm -hmm. And um, very, it would, that just simply wasn't true. Yeah. You know, we've had these, America is its own country, and, and the problems that we have are pervasive no matter where you are. Pullman porters and, 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 and postal workers mm -hmm. played a great part in this Green Book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, and postal workers, um, Victor Green was a genius because the reason why we're talking about the Green Book versus the other black travel guides that were in the you know, there was one called Travel Guide that was really popular, but still not, didn't have the longevity of the Green Book. But the reason why the Green Book was published for so long is because he was, Victor Green was a postal worker. He was, mm -hmm. he had, was only able to get a seventh grade education. Um, but because he was part of the union, um, and he was part of the white postal workers union, which is interesting. <laughs> um, but there was a black postal workers union. And so he reached out to them and made sure that throughout the country that they would take the green books to the, because it was segregated. So the black postal workers worked the black neighborhoods and they would take the green book and say, you know, to all the businesses and say, you should probably advertise in here. It'll just give you more business. And it was free to advertise unless you wanted a big ad or, you know, you paid for more space. 
So that's how it happened, and that's how it grew so quickly. Um, and also, he had partnered with Esso Gas Stations, which is ExxonMobil, mm -hmm. and that's why ExxonMobil sponsoring this exhibition. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really were on the right side of history, and they had two black marketing executives who um, also helped distribute the Green Book. So there was that happening, you know. There were so many other, um, you know, whether it was just, I mean, being a postal worker was one thing, but having so many opportunities to, by word of mouth or through these other businesses to help it grow. Um, you've got the porters um, who are working the trains, um, who are actually passing out you know, the Chicago Defender and the Green Book, and it was just, it took a village, right, to get us, you know, to get us that information. And every SO gas station would sell a green, would sell green books. So that's also how it, it spread. Yeah. Black entrepreneurship, and we see how it was thriving during the time of the Green Book, and you kind of talked a little bit about it. But let's really go into that, because everything just changed with redlining. And, yeah. and, and what happened? What, what was it? Well, you know, 19, the Green Book was in publication until 1967. Mm -hmm. But, of, co of course, 1965, the, uh, well, the Civil Rights Act is 1964, and then you've got you know, the Voting Rights Act, and then you've got the housing. I mean, there's a lot of civil rights legislation happening. And you could see, again, the writing on the wall. There were more white businesses that were included in the Green Book in the 60s. And say, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example of the Dew Drop, um, which is in New Orleans. And it was this incredible nightclub. And they had every, I mean, all the big stars were there. and. You know, it was segregated. It, it was all, it was black owned and, um, but white folks loved it because the music was so good. So they would always come and it would get shut down or, you know, get raided by the cops because literally they were not allowed to integrate these spaces. So the cops would come and shut it down. It was really annoying. And black people couldn't go to the French Quarter during this time because it was no black people were allowed in the French Quarter. So. Mm -hmm. The Dew Drop was, you know, the club to go to, and it was good food and all these great acts. And um, so finally, you know, the Civil Rights Act happens, and it, you know, can be integrated. But then all the black people stopped going to the Dew Drop because they were like, well, I want to go to the French Quarter. I want to see what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these spaces that black people have been shut out of, you know, every major downtown and pretty, whether it was like Miami Beach or... You know, all of these areas that were so popular all of a sudden were open to black people and they abandoned these businesses that had been so successful for so many decades. And you really just see in the late 60s and the 70s, these, you know, they just become, you know, just shells of what's one, what they once were. And you see crime increasing in these communities and you see all of these problems. Um, you know, Ron, my stepfather, said integration was the worst thing that happened to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I didn't understand that mm -hmm. when he first told me that. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I finished writing this book, I understand why he, why mm -hmm. he said that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the chapter, you know, I think is dub this, uh, integration, dub the double-edged sword of mm -hmm. integration is the name of that chapter. Because it is this, you know, as a country, I think, you know, this is still an experiment, right? Mm -hmm. It's not been proven to work yet. Mm -hmm. Nobody's been able to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think this assumption that we're just all supposed to get along and everything's supposed to, you know, it's like coming to the table with that assumption is the problem. Mm -hmm. And realizing how difficult of a task we are trying to accomplish. And so for so many decades, we've just pretended that we're there, and then you see all the fallout before your eyes, but then we ignore that until it comes on our doorstep and we have to address it. So hopefully my, my you know, I'm usually not, there's this whole thing, hope is a tool in the exhibition, but it took me a while, I, I, even with my team, I was like, I'm not very hopeful most days. Mm -hmm. um, but the only thing I do feel 
you know, after COVID and, you know, the George Floyd protests and seeing that capture people's minds and hearts around the world um, in the same way that Mississippi did in the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. um, I found, well, now I'm living through this era and I thought maybe, you know, there's a, just a small opportunity for us to see it as it really is. I don't think we're going to change it in my lifetime. But if we see the problem, we can at least address it. We have not seen the problem as a society. Yeah. So for me, that's where, you know, I'm hoping this exhibition and other, and the book, yeah. you know, helps you really understand the magnitude of what we're trying to do mm -hmm. um, as a country and to support that. It doesn't mean you have to be, doesn't mean that America's a bad place. Doesn't mean that, you know, we're failing at this. Like I said, nobody's been able to accomplish it yet in the world. It's a tall order. But we're all going to have to work towards that goal if we want it. And then we can celebrate after that. Mm -hmm. But not yet. In line with everything that's going on, with profiling and African Americans driving all over the country, do, and I asked you this question before, and, and you allude to it in the book because somebody asks you this question. Do you think we need a green book today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, and I think what I said to you is that I don't want to ever discourage somebody, you know, to, because there's a lot of, you know, when I started this project, 2013, barely anybody, there were just a few little academic circles, people who knew about the green book and who had written dissertations on it. And um, Ruth and the Green Book was a book Calvin Ramsey had done, and um, but very, it, you know, once a film came out and it became kind of a brand name, and now that, you know, a lot of people know about the Green Book, there's just a lot of Green Book projects and people are doing these, they're just slapping Green Book on everything, you know, whether it's anything travel related and black, <laughs> call it Green Book, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate because, you know, those aren't real green book sites and green book sites are so rare. Mm -hmm. And they're so, you know, for me to find these objects and the, I'm digging around the dirt and Murray's, you know, in the desert in 110 degree weather, and, you know, it's like, it, to me, um, I appreciate the excitement about the green book, but these new kind of green book travel guides, um, I feel are missing the point because mm -hmm. The laws did change. You know, these spaces, we can go to restaurants and hotels and, you know, we could still be turned away at Starbucks. I get that. You know, there's things that, get, that happen. Um, but legally, the laws did change. Um, whether you get there alive and safely, mm -hmm. that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with the guide. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, I think the systems that have helped to, you know, exacerbate either poverty or create spaces that are not welcoming. Ironically, as a black woman, some of the black spaces that, you know, I can't, I have to be very careful in. Um, to me, that is the real issue. And that's what we need to focus on. So from, you know, after George Floyd happened and so many of my well-meaning white liberal friends would call me in tears, or after Charlottesville happened, you know, they'd say, oh my God, why, it's 2016, it's 2017, it's 2020, like, why is this happening? What can I do? And I always kind of throw it back to them and say, I don't know, you tell me, what can you do? <laughs> because you're the ones who have, do you have a, do you own a business? You know, do you have, um, uh, do you rent your place? Do you run a bank? Do you you know, what are your, take the felony box off your applications. Um, mentor somebody from a disadvantaged neighborhood. I mean, there's a list of things. You tell, you, only you know what you are good at or you have access to or what circles you can actually create some kind of, you know, change. Um, and I think we all have our own special power mm -hmm. to do that. So, but the fact that people want to, you know, I think is progress. But it is very challenging, um, you know, as a 
black woman who wrote a book that's been looking back at you know all of these moments where we did make strides and we did move forward and then to see us fall back you know our history has never been linear we've never just gotten better as a country it's not how we've you know something we get we make these strides forward and then something happens and then there's a backlash that is our process so i think again believing that we're just supposed to be getting better is another you know, either I think maybe it comforts us <laughs> in a way, but it's denial. Mm. And so if anything, I hope, you know, it really just r helps you understand this struggle that we're in differently. Um, and I think we can find our own moments around each other, you know, and it starts very small in terms of how we, you know, connect and have people address us and see us as black folks for who we really are, you know? Um, but it, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's, you know, I, writing this book, I mean, every few weeks I'd have to just push away from my desk and mm -hmm. cry yeah. because it was so, you know, I was like, if I read about another black family who's been humiliated or, or harmed um, and the, you know, and the lynchings and the horrific stories, it's just a lot to, to process and then see the news today and just feel like, why? You know, we are never going to get back to this um, unless we really think about it differently. And, you know, you said something because in the book, I, I remember you talking about how Victor Green would put on the Green book that you don't want to be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I know. He was so... I think he was he was living in New York too, which was even though Harlem was segregated, it was a kind of a utopia in Sugar Hill, mm. you know, um, and yeah, it was like you know I think the standard is uh, you know you can use this now so we don't have to be embarrassed, mm -hmm. and um, I think embarrassment was the least of your worries mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. but again even that you know the humiliation that kind of um, you know, if a family would go to the beach and there would be no, you could go to the beach, it would be an integrated beach, but there would be no lockers for you as a black person. So you'd bring sheets, sometimes Sometimes you wouldn't know that. You'd get there and you'd have to undress on the beach, you know, and then once you got in the water and you came back, you know, your things were either stolen or soiled or, you know, by, you know, it just, to me, it's like, Again, that's why I find so much inspiration and courage, you know, um, in the faces of the people who, who you know, we have upstairs um, to see that, you know, they weren't bitter or they don't look bitter. They don't look, I mean, our standards for what we expect today, you know, they didn't have those expectations. Mm -hmm. Of course, it looks, it's horrible now knowing what we know. Um, but I think it's, it's still very... Um, inspirational and and to me shows that if they can do that and get through that mm -hmm. and live through that mm -hmm. and survive it mm -hmm. you know with all the resources and the internet and the you know <laughs> what is our problem yeah yeah no one of the things that that really was powerful to me in the book you say more than a new green book we need to learn from our past mistakes this country was built on racism, and if we're not careful, racism is a weapon that will destroy it. The pendulum will simply keep swinging back and forth until it breaks. There will be times when the fight for justice feels futile, but these are the battles worth fighting for, even if we lose. And if in, if in another 20 or 50 years we find ourselves scratching our heads wondering why America still isn't living up to its promise of freedom and equality for all, at some point, we have to accept that we are all responsible. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really deep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I never want to say that, you know, as, especially as a black woman, that we really have the power to change this. But I think we all have our own place in this story and how we play that out with whether if you're raising kids or you have, you know, we do have some kind of impact 
in how our lives move forward. And I, you know, I just feel you cannot change a problem or even change yourself until you see the problem mm -hmm. and until you understand it. So, you know, I've always been hardest on myself <laughs> about then it, you know, I'm, I'm that it doesn't serve me all the time, but I do think having that introspection and having those quiet moments is what we've, you know, hopefully I think what COVID also taught us, you know, we had to slow down for a minute mm -hmm. um, and really reflect. And, you know, I think that was a gift in some ways. Um, what we do with that remains to be seen. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I just hope people find their own sense of, you know, purpose. And if we want to change this, that you, you know, make step towards it. Because I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of people who are in this wavelength who want things to be better around this issue. And I think in terms of, you know, who we elect, um, you know, to me, I feel like we're always trying to elect the person who is going to win or who's going to get, you know, I'd rather elect somebody who you think is saying something so radical that so seems like it's not good. I'd rather watch them try and fail than to just do the same thing that we know isn't working. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's, you know, failure is not a bad thing if you're really pushing for something that, because even if you get 10th of what you tried, it's better than, you know, doing the same thing. Yeah. So I hope you can apply that to any state, anything in your life. And now we're going to open the floor for questions. This has been amazing. If, any questions, please. Just a moment. Oh, we have to get the mic. Yeah, we have to get the mic. Okay. So raise been, your, raise yeah. your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. I'm just trying to picture the logistics of this of this green book. It was it was was it refreshed every year? Yes, it was an annual guide. It took a hiatus from 1942 to 46. The came back in 46 because of the war rationing. So how I'm just trying to be today we have Google. Today if somebody's in this book, they go online and say yes, I'm still here. Yes, I'm doing this. I'm still open whatever. But I'm trying to picture how in the world this could have happened in that era where there was no online communication, where there were people actually sitting and calling these Very businesses? Creative, yeah. Did he have a staff, or how did that happen? Yeah, there were no, yeah, they had a staff. There were no um, phone numbers even in the Green Book, so it was pretty fascinating. You would write a lot of letters. So, and for black folks to plan for a trip, it mm -hmm. took weeks. You know, you didn't just jump in your car. I mean, some people did, but that was not wise. You would write to these businesses and say, this is the dates I'm coming, and they would, you know, and you would show up. Sometimes there weren't even addresses in the green book. You'd just show up to the town, and it was the place, you know, that was on the main drag. Um, sometimes they would just have a street name and no address. But it, it is fascinating. And there were about usually five different um, exec, you know, people that Victor hired um, to kind of oversee and actually go. He did vet all of the places in the early editions, but mm -hmm. then it got too big. Um, but if you go to, and I want to say the Schomburg Center in New York is an incredible, I mean, I would have no project without the Schomburg. They digitized um, all of their editions, which are 24 editions. So if you Google uh, New York Public Library Green Book, or Schomburg, you know how to spell it, Green Book, all of them will come up and you can flip through them and see them. And then we'll have some um, slides later that will, you know, that have some of the pages in the green book. Mm -hmm. And there's some upstairs too. Thank you for, for writing, uh, researching and, and writing this book. I, 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 I had, um, my first, I, 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 I have about three questions. Um, well, well, one is when you mentioned the, the stop um, with, I think you're, you're a stepfather. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if there was a college difference between 
who was sitting in the passenger seat. Mm -hmm. And that came to mind be, it, because uh, 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 reading Bobby Rush's book, mm -hmm. he mentioned that because his mother was so mm -hmm. light, mm -hmm. There, there were stores that she could go into mm -hmm. and get things right. that the normal darker skinned person That's would right. not be able to. So I'm wondering yeah. if this was a similar yeah. case. Yeah. Then the, the, um, the second thing on my, on my mind is um, when when I was in, in Boston, like, there, there were um, a street where they had brownstones. Mm -hmm. And when the black entertainers came into town, mm -hmm. that's where they stayed. Mm -hmm. So um, it, 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 as, as far, far north as Massachusetts, and, mm -hmm. and I'm glad mm -hmm. you, you emphasized that it was a whole country mm -hmm. that there were restrictions. Yeah, yes. Um, well, colorism, thank you for the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, colorism is definitely a big piece of um, our history and our present even. And there's a section in the book about mm -hmm. colorism. Um, Ron's uh, step, I mean, they were still medium black. You know, it was obvious they were not passing. Like his, um, his uh, mother was not so fair skin, but although he did have people in his family who could pass, mm -hmm. um, but Ron, as I said, you know, is very dark skinned, mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know, with um, but there's definitely stories of in the book of a father son traveling, and the son is so fair skinned he can pass, and so he would have him go and get reserve the room. And in one situation, um, they are kind of made out. They, like they realize that the father is, you know, that they're a black family. And so the management came to them and said, I'm not going to make you leave, but if anybody asks, you have to say you're Mexican. Mm. <laughs> so that's how that story went. Um, so yeah, it, it's crazy, right? So that, and um, I'm sorry, the other question was about the north, about Boston. I, I think some of those brownstones I've actually scouted um, that were in the green book, there was, because um, Broxbury obviously is a black neighborhood of Boston, but, um, but there were areas in the south end that were also um, popular in the green book, and Charlie's Place is a green book. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was called Charlie's. Charlie's Place was in South Carolina, but Charlie's was right below the, um, the Porter uh, Union's, mm -hmm. um, the Brotherhood of the Porter Union's um, headquarters. And even though it was a white-owned business, you get to you know, read about in the book. But yeah, Boston's a complicated city. And um, <laughs> yeah, the racism and segregation there. I lived in Boston, too. So uh, it, it, you know, it has an incredible history. But um, the North was, you know, as I said, just as more, I think even more problematic than the South. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm curious about your process in terms of research. It sounds like, I haven't read the book yet, but it sounds like you use a lot of personal stories and stories from people you may have interviewed. Um, so I wondered what your process was like in doing those interviews. Yeah, I, um, my f first book, Counterculture, was on the American Diner Waitress, which was an, almost 90% just oral histories. Um, this book is definitely a balance between, you know, oral histories and then the tangible, like the, the actual research of understanding the history. I mean, I hired, you know, historians from um, Harvard to look, to help me edit this book to make sure that I got it right that I wasn't presuming, because if you read 10 different stories about something, it doesn't make it true, right? And that's why I even asked Ron, you know, I'm seeing this in the archives with the chauffeur's hat, but then getting his personal testimony felt like, wow, that gave it a different weight. So I try and do a balance between the two. I'm a very um, 
dogged uh, researcher, but again, I think the field research also informed a different story. Um, the fact that Ron becomes a, a narrative thread was by accident mm -hmm. because he died the first week I started writing the, sto the book, and I was devastated um, because I just had all this time with him, and it was the first time we'd had that kind of relationship and to lose him at that time was so devastating to me. I would just wake up every morning and watch the, I was living in Bisbee, Arizona. It's a long story. I was supposed to be living in South Carolina, but the hurricanes <laughs> basically made it impossible for me to, you know, it was during that time there were three hurricanes coming one after the other. I was driving around the South for weeks and I couldn't get to my rented place where I was gonna write this book in South Carolina in Beaufort. So I ended up finding this place. I lived in Bisbee, Arizona. I just kept getting pushed west. And I'd sit there on the, this deck watching the sun come up every morning with the Bisbee Mountains, and I would just cry because I was so devastated that I had lost Ron. And, and I thought, all I can do is write Ron's stories. So I called my agent, and I said, I know I'm supposed to be writing the book because <laughs> I had eight months to write that book. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, but all I can do is write Ron's stories, and I think I'm going to open it with his story about the chauffeur's hat. And she said, just keep going. And then he becomes this narrative thread. But had he lived, I probably wouldn't have done it. I mean, the irony is he loved being the center of attention. So I know he's looking down on this thinking, <laughs> you know. And I was in, I did a talk in the hills of Kentucky. And the woman asked, um, you know, is there going to be a book about Ron? You know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, he would love that. Um, so that's, you know, so it was kind of a happy, uh, well, it was bittersweet, you know, um, that he becomes, I think he humanizes the story in a way that makes the book much more successful, honestly, but that wasn't, it happened, that wasn't over the original plan. We have a few questions from the live stream. Let me oh. pass these along. Uh, Charlie Brenner asks, was the ancient Chicago hotel called Congress Plaza in Green Book? Um, I think it was called the Congress, but I don't think it pl Plaza was, um, I'd have to look at my notes, but I think it was just called the Congress on the main drag there with. Congress, okay. Congress. Yeah, confirmation. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of recommendations for the PBS documentary Driving While Black, Race, Space, and Mobility in America. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a question about whether during your travels, um, Ken Dacey, you explored any sites in Jackson or the state that were Green Book locations. Oh, yeah. And I actually, I'm, my social media handle is at Ken Dacey Taylor. Um, but I did post some... Um, sites that I had photographed, and um, Fire Street mm -hmm. apparently is, you know, your, uh, and again, the things that we discussed, you know, this, the state of that is so unfortunate. I do, I did look at some um, uh, newspaper articles this week just to see where it's at, and I see that there are some attempts in trying to bring it back, and I hope that, you know, so I put out a social media um, uh, just basically saying, you know, let's do this, let's really people who can be in charge of this or create some kind of real progress because there, there's definitely a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners that can actually you know, show up in some of these spaces. They're, they've been abandoned. Um, why can't they be reclaimed for viable businesses? Um, and then there's the EF Young in Meridian. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And then there's the one in Clarksdale, um, the Riverside Hotel. And they did get a big grant from the National Park Service, so that was exciting. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's been great. Um, I've got a friend who's CEO of an organization called um, Seat at the Table. Mm -hmm. And I think the main goal of his organization is to align black consumers with black-owned businesses, oh, wow. which sounds to me like very much a contemporary green book. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you did touch briefly on that in your talk, um, and I wonder if you have any opinions on his and similar organizations like that. Yeah, I don't know a seat at the table is what it's called. Yeah, it's a seat at the table. Yeah, I mean, I think to me that is the inspiration of what green book was, was really black entrepreneurship. Right, I mean, that's a symbol of what Victor Green did, I think. Again, the fact that it was this black yellow pages is really significant. 
Um, and I, I love, you know, that as a brand, it is a very exciting, it inspiring people to do things. I would like to see all of these black businesses actually get the right capital and the fair treatment for, you know, loans. I mean, I think to me it's the system. Why do we have to have so much, you know, putting it, again, on us as citizens or even as black people to support black businesses, why is it that black businesses struggle more than, than others? It's because of they can't get the loans, they can't get the insurance, they can't, you know, because there are certain insurance rates are higher because they're in different neighborhoods. That, those are the obstacles that I think need to be addressed and removed. And I think that will put us on fair, equal ground. Um, but again, I think, yeah, having a book that actually gets more people to the place is, is a first step. But I think it's, it's just a minor, you know, it's not going to fix our problem. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, both yeah, both ground up and from top to bottom, I guess. You know, we have to think of the other as well. Yeah. But good for you. Yeah, I think it's a great, it sounds like a great. They're also a member of the U.S. Black Chamber, which is oh, perfect. great. Perfect. Yeah. 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 No, we need more of that for sure. I won't. Thank, I know there are more question. questions. Uh, as per usual, we have more questions than we have time for oh. during this part of it. The good news is, Candace will be over here signing copies of her book, Overground Railroad, and you can certainly ask any of those questions there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there are facsimile editions of several of the green books that are for sale over here, too. So if you would like to see what they looked like, mm -hmm. there's your opportunity for that as well. Thank you and all for being here today. Also, just to say quickly, yes. if anybody, you know, I mean, the last one that went for auction, the real green book, sold for over $30,000. So check your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I've been looking for one for a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope that we see you at the gallery talk tomorrow for the Marty Stewart exhibit. Don't forget our musical program this weekend. Then come back for History is Lunch next week. Today, though, help me thank our friends in the Mississippi Humanities Council, Pamela Jr. and Candace Taylor for this fabulous program. <laughs>